Hello, and welcome to the Joyful Bookshelf, where books are fun. Subscribe for new books read aloud every week. Are You a Dragonfly? by Judy Allen and Tudor Humphreys. Are you a dragonfly? If you are, your mother laid her eggs in the stem of water plants. You swam out of one of them, and so did lots of others just like you. You are very small. You are very hungry. And guess what? You can breathe water through the end of your tail. Eat and grow. Eat tiny water creatures. You have a special grabber for catching them. It's called a mask because it covers half of your face. Creep up on your prey, then shoot out your mask and grab it. Eat and grow until your skin is so tight you have to take it off. Then eat and grow some more and do it again. And again, and again. Don't worry, there will always be new skin underneath. Now that you have grown larger, you can eat larger food. Try a tadpole or a small fish. But be careful, there are plenty who would like to eat you. Beware of water beetles. Water beetles pounce. Beware of ducks. Ducks dive and they're big. Two years have passed. You're bored with life in the water. Crawl up a plant stem and into the air. Do this at night so birds don't see you and eat you. Hold on tight. As you dry, your skin splits one more time. Slowly, slowly, climb out of your old skin. First, pull your head free, then pull your legs free. Flop over backward and have a rest. Now, lean forward, grab your old skin, and pull your whole body out. Guess what? Now you can breathe air through tiny holes on the sides of your body. You're a dragonfly. At first, you're very pale and crumpled, but your beautiful colors will come and your two pairs of wings will straighten out. You're a fantastic flyer. You can fly fast, you can hover, you can even fly backward. You have enormous eyes. You can see all around you all the time. You can see what's behind you, in front of you, above you, below you, and beside you. This is very useful when you're looking for food. This is also very useful when you are dodging hungry birds and avoiding spiders' webs. You were a fierce hunter underwater. Now you are a fierce hunter in the air. Hunt over ponds and streams and slow-flowing rivers. Hunt over marshes and in forests. Hold your legs out in front of you to catch your prey. Hunt midges and mosquitoes, flies, wasps, and small butterflies. When you catch something, eat it. You are a hawker. You hunt when you're flying. This dragonfly is a darter. It sits still until it sees its prey. Then it darts out and grabs it. This is not a dragonfly at all. It's a damselfly. It's thinner and lighter and slower than you are. It likes to pick small insects off leaves and flowers. Now look around you. If you and all your friends look a little like this or this or this, you are not a dragonfly. You are a human child. You can't fly. You can't breathe underwater. It's very unlikely that you have a mask attached to your face. But you can do a lot of things that dragonflies can't do. You don't have to keep taking your skin off, and you don't have to eat midges and mosquitoes. Best of all, you'll never, ever, ever be eaten by a duck. Birds by Kevin Hankies, illustrated by Laura Dronzek. In the morning, I hear birds singing through the open window. Birds can be yellow, or blue, or brown, or red, or even green, I think. 
Sometimes they are so black that you can't see their eyes or their feathers, just their shapes. Birds can be big or little or any size in between. Once I saw seven birds on the telephone wire. They didn't move and they didn't move and they didn't move. I looked away for just a second and they were gone. If birds made marks with their tail feathers when they flew, think what the sky would look like. If clouds were birds, the sky would look like this. Or this. Sometimes in winter, a bird in a tree looks like one red leaf left over. If there are lots of birds in one tree and they all fly away at the same time, it looks like the tree yelled. Surprise! If I were a bird, I'd ask where all the other birds go when it's stormy and they can't get home to their nests. I like to pretend I'm a bird. I can't really fly, but I can do this. I can sing. My Busy Green Garden by Terry Pierce, illustrated by Carol Schwartz. This is my busy green garden. There's a surprise and clever disguise that hangs in my busy green garden. This is a ladybug dawdling so near the surprise and clever disguise that hangs in my busy green garden. This is a honeybee buzzing below the red spotted ladybug dawdling so near the surprise in clever disguise that hangs in my busy green garden. This is a hummingbird fluttering round, the hurrying honeybee buzzing below, the red spotted ladybug dawdling so, near the surprise in clever disguise that hangs in my busy green garden. This is an inchworm who creeps up and down, dodging the hummingbird fluttering round, the hurrying honeybee buzzing below, the red spotted ladybug dawdling so, near the surprise and clever disguise that hangs in my busy green garden. This is a mantis awaiting his prey, spying the inchworm who creeps up and down, dodging the hummingbird fluttering round, the hurrying honeybee buzzing below, the red spotted ladybug dawdling so, near the surprise in clever disguise that hangs in my busy green garden. This is a dragonfly dashing away that startles the mantis awaiting his prey, spying the inchworm who creeps up and down, dodging the hummingbird fluttering round, the hurrying honeybee buzzing below, the red spotted ladybug dawdling so, near the surprise in clever disguise that hangs in my busy green garden. These are the ants that are tracking their scout, ignoring the dragonfly dashing away, that startles the mantis awaiting his prey, spying the inchworm who creeps up and down, dodging the hummingbird fluttering round, the hurrying honeybee buzzing below, the red spotted ladybug dawdling so, near the surprise in clever disguise that hangs in my busy green garden. This is a grasshopper leaping about, vaulting the ants that are tracking their scout, ignoring the dragonfly dashing away, that startles the mantis awaiting his prey, spying the inchworm who creeps up and down, dodging the hummingbird fluttering round, the hurrying honeybee buzzing below, the red spotted ladybug dawdling so, near the surprise in clever disguise that hangs in my busy green garden. This is a chickadee, hungry and quick. He chases the grasshopper bounding about, that scatters the ants that were tracking their scout, that flee from the dragonfly dashing away, that muddles the mantis awaiting his prey, that jiggles the inchworm who creeps up and down, that flusters the hummingbird fluttering round, that angers the honeybee buzzing below, that launches the ladybug dawdling so, 
that bumps the surprise in clever disguise, that wriggles and writhes, then stretches and flies away from my busy green garden. Mouse's First Spring by Lauren Thompson, illustrated by Bucket Erdogan. One windy spring day, Mouse and Mama went out to play. There in the grass, Mouse found something glittery and flittery. What can it be? wondered Mouse. Look, said Mama, a butterfly. Then whoosh blew the wind, and fluttery buttery the butterfly flew away. There under a leaf, Mouse found something slithery and slimy. What can it be? wondered Mouse. Look, said Mama, a snail. Then whoosh blew the wind, and Heidi inside the snail hid away. There on a branch, Mouse found something feathery and plump. What can it be? wondered Mouse. Look, said Mama, a bird. Then whoosh blew the wind, and dip, flip, flap, the bird darted away. There by the pond, Mouse found something green and peeping. What can it be? wondered Mouse. Look, said Mama, a frog. Then whoosh blew the wind, and splishy splash, the frog hopped away. There in the dirt, Mouse found something pink and wiggly. What can it be? wondered Mouse. Look, said Mama, a worm. Then whoosh blew the wind, and squiggly squeeze, the worm slid away. There on a stem, Mouse found something sweet and petally. What can it be? wondered Mouse. Look, said Mama, a flower. Then whoosh blew the wind, and rumply bumply, Mouse tumbled away. Then all around, Mouse felt something soft and cuddly and oh so cozy. What can it be? wondered Mouse. Smooch came a kiss, and ooch came a hug. It's me, said Mama. Spring is here, little mouse, and I love you. Mrs. McNosh Hangs Up Her Wash, written by Sarah Weeks, pictures by Nadine Bernard Westcott. Each Monday at dawn, Mrs. Nellie McNosh brings out a barrel and does a big wash. It takes her all morning, and when the sun's high, she hangs what she's washed on the clothesline to dry. She hangs up the dresses. She hangs up the shirts. She hangs up the underwear, nightgowns, and skirts. She hangs up the stockings. She hangs up the shoes. She wrings out the paper and hangs up the news. She hangs up the dog and his dish and his bone. She gets a wrong number and hangs up the phone. She hangs up a hat and an old wedding gown and two sleepy bats, which she hangs upside down. She hangs up a lamp and a large Christmas wreath and Grandpa McNosh's removable teeth. She hangs up a kite by the tip of its tail. The postman arrives and she hangs up the mail. She hangs till she's hung every last thing in sight, including the turkey she's roasting that night. Each Monday by dusk, Mrs. Nellie McNosh has finally hung up the last of her wash. She takes off her apron and lets down her hair, then hangs herself up in a comfortable chair. Fancy Nancy, Time for Puppy School by Jane O'Connor I am thrilled. Thrilled means excited, only fancier. School starts soon. I will miss Frenchie very much. All summer we played together. I simply adore Frenchie. 
Adore means love, love, love. Frenchie is the best dog ever. But sometimes she is naughty. That means she gets into trouble. Frenchie watches me plan my ensemble for school. Ensemble is fancy for outfit. Frenchie wants to play tug of war with my belt. No, I tell her. Belts are not toys. Now I need to find my backpack. Here it is. It looks too small for me. I grew a lot this summer. I show my backpack to mom. Mom says, we can buy a new one. Then she runs into the kitchen. No, she tells Frenchie, you can't jump up on the table. The next day, my mom and I go shopping. I pick out a purple backpack. At home, I tie ribbons around the straps and make big bows. I write out my name in jewel stickers. Voila! In French, that means, look at that. Now my new backpack is perfect. At dinner, I tell my parents, I am going to learn so much at school. By the end of the year, I may even be a genius. A genius is a super smart person. I have to talk very loudly. That's because Frenchie is barking. She wants some of our dinner. No barking, my dad tells her. This is people food, not dog food. After dinner, I run upstairs to get my new backpack. I want to show my mom and dad how fancy I made it. Oh no! Somebody pulled off the fancy stuff! And I know who did it. Frenchie! Frenchie, that was very naughty, I say. Frenchie looks so sorry. I give her a big kiss. I really do adore her. My mom hears me talking to Frenchie. She sees what Frenchie did. You know what? I think Frenchie needs to go to puppy school, she says. Puppy school? Ooh la la! Frenchie starts on Monday. I let her wear my old backpack. It is filled with puppy treats. All the dogs are adorable. That's fancy for cute. We watch the teacher train the dogs. Frenchie learns a lot. By the end of the week, Frenchie plays with only her toys. She does not bark and beg for food. Even at home, Frenchie leaves people stuff alone. She really is the best puppy ever. The night before school, I get out my ensemble. I put new ribbons and stickers on my backpack. Then I give Frenchie a kiss and tickle her tummy. You were a very good student. I am proud of you. It's funny, Frenchie is all done with school and I haven't even started yet. The Rainy Day by Anna Milborn and Sarah Gill. Big, dark clouds are hiding the sun. It looks like it's going to be a rainy day. Have you ever wondered what clouds are made of? Sometimes they look as if you could cuddle them. But really, they're nothing but wispy mist. Clouds are made of lots and lots of teeny tiny water drops. Inside the clouds, the water drops grow bigger and bigger. After a while, they grow so big and so heavy, they fall right out of the sky and it starts to rain. The rain falls softly at first Birds huddle in the trees to keep their feathers dry. Other animals hop and creep and crawl away to hide. Then all at once it pours and pours. The rain makes puddles on the ground. Splish, splash, splosh. Snails like being out in the rain. Wriggly worms love getting wet. Frogs come out to hop about and splash in the puddles. Plants like the rain too. Rain trickles into the soil. Thirsty plants suck it up through their roots. The sun peeps out from behind the clouds and shines through the falling rain. A beautiful rainbow appears in the sky. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. 
As the rain stops, the rainbow gently fades away. The clouds float away across the sky. The ground has turned into squishy mud. Squelch, squelch. A thousand tiny raindrops sparkle in the grass, and little birds take baths in the puddles. The warm sunshine dries up all the rain. Slowly, the puddles get smaller and smaller until they're all gone. It looks like it's going to be a sunny afternoon. There was an old lady who swallowed a chick by Lucille Calandro, illustrated by Jared Lee. There was an old lady who swallowed a chick. I don't know why she swallowed that chick, but she didn't get sick. There was an old lady who swallowed some straw. The chick looked in awe as she swallowed the straw. She swallowed the straw to cover the chick. I don't know why she swallowed that chick, but she didn't get sick. There was an old lady who swallowed an egg. She didn't beg to swallow that egg. She swallowed the egg to jazz up the straw. She swallowed the straw to cover the chick. I don't know why she swallowed that chick, but she didn't get sick. There was an old lady who swallowed some candy. She knew the candy would come in handy. She swallowed the candy to sweeten the egg. She swallowed the egg to jazz up the straw. She swallowed the straw to cover the chick. I don't know why she swallowed that chick, but she didn't get sick. There was an old lady who swallowed a basket. A tisket, a tasket, a brightly colored basket. She swallowed the basket to carry the candy. She swallowed the candy to sweeten the egg. She swallowed the egg to jazz up the straw. She swallowed the straw to cover the chick. I don't know why she swallowed that chick, but she didn't get sick. There was an old lady who swallowed a bow. Oh, what a show when she swallowed that bow. She swallowed the bow to tie on the basket. She swallowed the basket to carry the candy. She swallowed the candy to sweeten the egg. She swallowed the egg to jazz up the straw. She swallowed the straw to cover the chick. I don't know why she swallowed that chick, but she didn't get sick. There was an old lady who started to hop. She jumped up and down and just wouldn't stop. As she skipped down the trail on a day that was sunny, guess who she met? The Easter Bunny! Happy Easter! Are You a Snail? by Judy Allen and Tudor Humphreys Are you a snail? If you are, your life began in an egg like one of these. When you hatch, you look like this. This is your mother. You are much smaller than your mother. You are very, very small, but you will grow. You have two horns and two eyes on stalks. You can pull your eyes right down inside the stalks and into your head if you need to. You are slimy. You are very slimy. You have a shell with a beautiful pattern on it. You have no legs and only one foot, but it is a strong foot. The slime on your strong foot helps you slide along. Wherever you go, you leave a silvery, slimy trail. You like damp places. You like to be outside when it has rained. You have a big, rough tongue right inside of your mouth. Use it to rip pieces off of leaves and eat them. Watch out for thrushes. Thrushes are dangerous. They like to eat snails. They know how to break the shells off and they don't mind the slime. Hide in the daytime. Go out at night when the thrushes are asleep. Look out for foxes. Foxes are dangerous. Hungry foxes eat snails and they don't mind the slime either. Foxes go out at night, but you can't hide at night because you need to eat sometime. Just be careful. Do not go where humans go. You could get squashed. You move too slowly to get out of the way. 
Humans don't like you because you eat their plants. They might put poison or sharp gravel in the garden. It hurts to walk on gravel. Also, it sticks to your slime. And poison? Poison is poisonous. You may meet someone who looks like this. It is not a snail whose shell has fallen off. This is a slug. The winter cold makes you sleepy. Find a safe place. Your slime hardens into a door in your shell. The spring warmth wakes you. Dribble on the inside of your shell door. It melts away. Slime off and find food. However, if you look a little like this, or this, or this, or this, you are not a snail. You are a human child. You have no shell on your back. You have no horns, and your eyes are not on stalks. But you can do a lot of things that snails can't do. You are not afraid of thrushes or foxes. Most humans like you. Best of all, you are not in the least bit slimy. At Grandpa's Sugar Bush by Margaret Carney and Janet Wilson. During spring school break, I go to my grandpa's farm. He's working in the sugar bush and needs my help. Warm weather in February made a hard crust on the deep snow. We haul sap buckets and spiles to the sugar bush on sleds. In the fresh snow that fell overnight, we see fox tracks and weasel tracks. Red squirrels scold us from the spruce trees on our way into the bush. A flock of evening grosbeaks flies over. Grandpa says the funny yank yank we hear is made by the white-breasted nuthatches getting ready to nest in a crack in a big old maple tree. We find the holes the pileated woodpeckers are making, and we often hear them drumming. Many of the sugar maples are more than a hundred years old. Grandpa knows every tree in the bush, just as his dad did. Someday, I will too. Grandpa drills a hole in the first maple tree on the southeast side. The bright spring sun warms that side first. I clean out the wood shavings with a twig. We put in a spile and tap it gently with a hammer. It seems to take forever, but finally a big drop of sap forms at the tip of the spile. I catch it on my tongue and taste its sweetness. We hang a sap bucket from the spile and cover it with a lid. For a while, we can hear the plink, plink of sap dripping onto the bottom of the bucket. Grandpa says the first robin always sings on the day the sap starts to run. After lunch, the sun grows warm and the snow becomes soft. Grandpa's feet leave deep holes in the snow. Mine leave little holes. Snow fleas gather in our footprints. They're another sign of spring, Grandpa says. Every day we collect the sap, carrying it to big barrels near the boiling place. Last October, Grandpa felled dead trees, then cut and split them into firewood. I helped him haul and pile it. Grandpa digs snow out of the boiling place and I bring him the pieces of stovepipe. When everything is ready and the sap barrels are full, we start the fire. First smoke, then heat waves rise up the chimney. Soon, steam from the sap pan will smell sweet and mapley. Whenever we're thirsty, we cool boiling sap in the snow and drink it. It gets sweeter and sweeter and stickier. We keep adding sap to the boiling pan. If it boils dry, the syrup will burn. Grandpa skims off the foam with a large tin spoon full of holes. Every hour, he builds up the fire in the long tunnel under the sap pan. I ask him to let me put the first stick on the bed of glowing red coals. The heat makes my face tingle. Grandpa goes back to the sugar bush after supper, but I go to bed. Working in the bush makes you hungry and very tired. One night, he lets me come along. A big sugar moon lights our path. Finally, the syrup is ready. It drips from the ladle in a sheet. Grandpa carefully draws the sap pan off the fire onto the green poles we propped up on forked sticks. I help him strain the syrup through a cloth to remove bits of dirt and ash. Then we get to clean the pan. 
We scrape the thick, sticky syrup from the bottom with wooden spoons Grandpa carved out of cedar. It's yummy! We pour the warm syrup into old cream cans. When it's cool, we haul the cans out of the bush on the sled, back to the farmhouse. The next morning, we have maple syrup and pancakes for breakfast. Grandma says Grandpa and I make the tastiest syrup in the county. I think it's the best in the whole world. <laughs>